As of March 8th, 2024, I have officially beaten Rebirth, which means I can finally get back to my life. I've clocked in at about 90 hours of gameplay with only approximately 65% completion. And I blame Queen's Blood for about 5 hours of it, to be honest. I haven't had that much fun with a card game since Gwent in Witcher 3. Ever play Gwent? We will not only finish out the Crisis Saga to clarify why I was losing my mind when I got to play as Zack in Rebirth. Man is loyal to a fault. <gasps> Oh my god, I'm playing the Zack! This is awesome! <laughs> oh my god, Zack is f***ing him up. Ow, ow, shit! But also address some lore that was recently dropped about the Cetra and their extinction. Also, name change, because I'm a failure. New intro, coming at ya! First, some housekeeping. In part one, I said, Over 2,000 years before the original FF7, Genova came down from space, got picked as the imposter, and murdered 99.9% .9 of the Cetra population. Which is untrue. Genova killed a lot of people, sure, but it was humans that slaughtered the Cetra to the small amount that bordered on extinction. That's all I'm saying right now. Those who have already played Rebirth know why. I'd also like to point out some things about the life stream. Yes, when a living creature dies, they return to the planet, but that only works when their life force comes from the planet to begin with. Meaning, anything that isn't from this planet cannot return to it, which clears up my biggest question with Genova. Why couldn't she be killed? Simple, because she can't return to the life stream. So she essentially became fossilized after her defeat by the Cetra, making what happens in Advent Children rather interesting when you take everything under consideration. Second, I stated in the last video that Cisne met Tifa on Mount Nebel prior to the Nibelheim incident and recommended her for the survey party. Oh, Adam, come on. Stupid! No, we're gonna get, we'll try you off. very dumb. So either it was the Turk shotgun who met Tifa, or it was the Turk martial arts because she was the Turk president to call in about the Nibelheim incident, according to The Last Order. Most likely it was shotgun because she knows Cloud, so her name dropping him and Tifa being intrigued would make the most sense. And since we're already on the subject of Nibelheim, let's continue where we left off. I'm sorry. This is my job. There's no mission that's impossible for the Turks, yeah, yeah. Been thinking. Was all that necessary? Had we refused, someone else would have completed the task. We have spared that someone the burden of a guilty conscience. Perhaps that will ease yours. Do you actually believe that? Does it matter? Well, those left alive have a lot to atone for. Seriously, though. How are we ever supposed to atone for that? Hojo and the rest of the Turks arrive on the scene at the Nibelheim reactor. Hojo feels a burst of inspiration surface in his f***ed up mind. He tells the Turks to prepare Shinra Manor for his experiments, with Sephiroth being just too amazing of a creature to just let die, and considering Zack and Cloud were responsible for his death. Hojo wants to see if he can make clones of Sephiroth using the ones that defeated him. And because Nibelheim was burned to ashes by the company's poster child, any survivors would need to be dealt with, and Nibelheim restored to how it used to be, to avoid suspicion. And this is where the Turks come in. Veld, the leader of the Turks, heads to the manor to prepare it for Hojo, followed by Shotgun. In the manor, we learn more about Veld and that this isn't the first time he's had to do something like this. Many years ago, the town of Kalm was under attack from an enemy force. While it could be Wu Tai, Rebirth mentions a lot about how Junon was once its own republic and fought against Shinra to retain its independence, but ultimately lost. But all of that depends on when the war took place. Problem is, dates are not given for either the Kalm attack or the dates of the Junon Shinra War, which pisses me off because I need to know. I am the lore man. I speak for the weebs. Anyway, Veld describes that he and his family lived in Calm, 
While trying to state that the enemy was 50 kilometers north of Calm, radio interference causes the message to be muddled before cutting out. All the bombing squad heard was that Calm was the target. That day, Veld lost his home, his wife, his daughter Felicia, and his arm, forcing him to get a prosthetic. Similar to Nibelheim, all survivors of the bombing at Calm were taken to Shinra Manor for experimentation, and Calm would need to be rebuilt and repopulated as if nothing happened. The rest of the Turks are revolted by what they're being told to do, but Vel tells them that he will take care of it. That way their hands will be clean enough for them to sleep at night. And don't worry everyone, Fluffy gets away safely. Over in Corel, Zungun took Tifa to a doctor named Dr. Sheeran. While the surgery was a success to graft skin on Tifa's slice from Sephiroth, only Midgar has the tools needed for a full recovery. Apparently a Turk is responsible for getting Tifa and Zungun to Midgar by helicopter and under Shinra's knowledge. With Tifa now safe, Zungun disappears and hasn't been seen again in canon past this moment. No, he is not in Rebirth after the Nibelheim flashback, I checked. Tifa wakes up in the Sector 8 slums in the medical office of Dr. Domini Oranye and her son, Rakesh. Rakesh is also a disciple of Master Zungun, so Tifa trusts them straight away. Unfortunately, medical bills aren't cheap. Tifa is now in a strange place with no family, no friends, no home, and now an immense amount of debt that she will spend the next three or so years attempting to pay off. Rakesh sets Tifa up with an apartment, aka The Hole, and a job at a hot bun stand. It's run by a man called Pops, who would be Tifa's teacher in the way of the bun, and would give her some good advice for the next few years. We will check back in with Tifa in a few minutes. January 3rd, 2003. The Turks have discovered Avalanche's HQ in Wutai. Shinra begins preparing the army, but the mobilizing of forces is actually used more as a distraction. While Avalanche thinks they have time before Shinra arrives, the Turks have already infiltrated their HQ from above where they plant a bomb. Yuffie Kisaragi is also here snooping around, keeping an eye on the adults. It's from Shotgun that she first learns of the power of Materia planting the seed in Yuffie's head that with enough materia, Utai can be armed with enough power to overthrow Shinra. Which makes some sense considering that during the Soldier Project, materia use was becoming more prominent amongst its members and helped turn the tides of the war in Shinra's favor. With all of Avalanche supposedly blown up in the detonation of the bomb, there is peace for the next four months. It is at this point I should inform you that the Turks, or at least Veld, has his suspicions on who the person leaking information is, but needs more information. The culprit, is Rufus Shinra. He has been funding Avalanche since its inception and provided money and information in the hopes of either capturing or killing his father so that he could take hold of the company. Uh oh, someone has some daddy issues. For me, this is a dad issue. Dead issue, dead dad. Did be dead! Oh. Daddy didn't love me! But with no concrete evidence, Veld bides his time. It is April 12th, and we turn our attention to the plains behind Mount Nebel. An ace pilot of Shinra has mastered the skies and seeks to pilot the Shinra number 26 rocket into space, his lifelong dream. This pilot's name is Sid Highwind. Takeoff is set for tomorrow and will be televised to the world. While Rufus was keeping Veld and the Turks and Sid occupied, Avalanche attempted to sabotage the rocket. They managed to steal one of the oxygen tanks, forcing Sid and the mechanics to put in a new one within the span of a day. The rocket launch appears ready just in the nick of time the following day, but one of the mechanics, Shira, attempts to do one last check on the oxygen tanks before the launch, but the countdown has already started. Sid makes the decision to abort the launch one second before takeoff in order to keep Shira from being incinerated from the jet propulsion. The rocket begins flying off the ground for a few seconds before coming back down with an anticlimactic thud. It then begins to lean against its fasteners, where it will spend the next five years collecting rust. The space project has failed on live television, but considering this was more of a publicity stunt for Shinra rather than an opportunity to explore the great unknown, President Shinra uses this as an excuse to take away funding from the space division to pursue other ventures like R&D, public security, not you, and weapons development. By this point, Shinra has convinced the mining town of Corel to invest in Mako and have a reactor built. Dine, one of the influential voices in town, is entirely opposed to it, saying the town was built on the back of their ancestors and they can't just abandon their way of life. But in a world that is becoming more Mako dominant, coal just doesn't have a place anymore. The town was already poor, they wouldn't even be able to live there if they refused to build a reactor. Barrett Wallace, a big main character in Final Fantasy VII, reminds Dine that Dine has a baby, Marlene on the way, and that he should think of the life Mako could provide for her and his wife. The town is in agreement. Which brings us to May 8th, 
Avalanche has decided to reveal they are still alive by attacking the Maka reactor still under construction in Corel. The Turks arrive to deal with it, and even Barrett helps Shotgun get to the core where she finds Rufus Shinra there. He came to stop Avalanche considering he didn't tell them to attack the reactor. All of the Turks converge in an attempt to capture him under the president's orders. And that is when Avalanche reveals that this was all a trap. No longer needing Rufus's funding and intel, they plan to kill Rufus and the Turks in one fell swoop. But Veld recognizes Elf's voice. It's his daughter, Felicia. Apparently, she was presumed dead but survived the bombing at Calm. Since she was one of the survivors, she was used for Hojo's experiments. Alright, now this is where this shit gets really weird. Hojo was experimenting with Materia embedding, and Elf was embedded with the Materia summon Zirconiate. How did Hojo get his hands on it? I have no fucking idea. This summon isn't your typical summon like Ifrit or Bahamut. Zirconiate is so powerful that it requires four support Materia to summon fully. Reason why is because Zirconiate is also known as the World Burner. It has the capability of wiping out all life on the planet, thus causing their life force to return to the planet. And what does Hojo do with it? Embeds it into a child, deems her a failure, and tosses her out like trash. You're a fucking idiot! Fujito, who studies under the great elder of planetology Bugenhagen, more on him later, finds Felicia and gives her the name Elf because she has amnesia and can't remember anything prior to their meeting. Day by day, Zirconiade feeds off of Felicia. Fujito plans to use Zirconiade to save the planet by wiping out human life, including Shinra, and allow the planet to start fresh. Felicia breaking past her amnesia after hearing Veld's voice was apparently the catalyst allowing Zirconiade to initially activate. So now Fujito is officially on the search to find the rest of the support materia. With Veld now knowing that Felicia is alive, she is the only thing that matters to him now. He leaves the Turks, having Sung officially take charge. Fujito takes her away and blows up the reactor. The shotgun is the only Turk caught in the blast and crashes through the bottom of the reactor. There she runs into Shears, who no longer intends to follow Avalanche if Felicia is going to be used by Fujito. He has nothing but respect and admiration for her, so he will be helping Veld find and rescue her in the years to come. Shears and Shotgun get separated, but Shotgun manages to get to safety. Once she is safe, she collapses from too much Mako exposure. For the next three years, Shotgun is in a coma. Rufus is brought in by the Turks, but because he is the president's son and the vice president, he issues the Turks to keep him under house arrest. Rufus is given a room with a bunch of cameras to observe the world around him, but he is not allowed to leave, being hidden in the Turks' office, labeling this as Rufus being on another business trip to the public and the company. I'm sick of this. You murdered my dad! You burned my village! I know what I want, and I take it. I take advantage of whatever I can, and discard that which I cannot. There is no room for sentiment or guilt. What's done is done. Y'all gotta look at the bigger picture here. Nothing worth fighting for was ever won without sacrifice. But it's okay. Cause I'm here for you, to help take the load off your shoulders, your fears, your worries, your concerns, and yes, your fears. Whatever your problem, I got you. Since the reactor exploded on Shinra's watch and needs someone to blame it on, they decide to blame it publicly on Corel and lay waste to the town. Barrett and Dine were away, checking on the reactor explosion. When they arrived, Shinra, led by Scarlet, had already set fire to Corel. Barrett and Dine are now on the receiving end of Shinra's bullet hell. And because the Shinra troops are sadistic bastards, they shoot their arms, causing Dine to lose his arm and fall to his death, and Barrett to lose his arm as well. Now everyone say it with me, no body, no kill. Barrett survives and manages to make it back to Corel to see if there are any survivors. While there were a few, he also finds a house still on fire with a baby crying inside. He manages to grab the baby before the house collapses. It was Dine's daughter, Marlene. After speaking with an engineer named Sakaki about getting a new arm, one with a universal attachment, every other survivor hates Barrett with a fiery passion. Because he was one of the biggest advocates for the Maka reactors being built, everyone blames him for Shinra destroying their town, families, and livelihood. He knew that Marlene couldn't live like this, so he set out of Corel, attempting to find a new life for his new daughter vowing that Shinra will pay for what they've done. 2004. Due to mismanagement and lack of upkeep, the Gungaga reactor explodes, leaving many dead in its radius. 
While that is the reason given for a majority of the canon, I have another theory. Basically, one of Zirconiae's materia fragments was located there. Perhaps sometime after Elf's activation of the Zirconiae materia embedded in her, the support materia may have activated, causing the explosion. Could be the case, but that's all the evidence I have, and I don't even know if this whole Zirconiae Turk arc is truly canon anyway, so I don't really care if I'm right or wrong. February of 2005. Meanwhile, over in Midgar, Tifa is becoming more accustomed to her new life in the Sector 8 slums. One day in May, a new patient is at Dr. Aranye's office, an older woman named Marl. She needs skin grafts on her back after a monster encounter. The two really hit it off. Tifa being 16 at the time, Marl had a natural affinity toward her, seeing her like a daughter. They would see each other for the next three months until Marl was discharged from the hospital. Rakesh stated that she looked good after her surgery and wanted Tifa to be given her regard the next time Tifa came in. And just like that, Tifa was all alone again. Until one day, a roly-poly man requests 22 steamed buns from Tifa's stand. 20 for him, and one for each of his two friends. This was Tifa's first interaction with Wedge, Jesse, and Biggs of Avalanche. So a quick synopsis of Tifa's time in Sector 8 stretching to about June. May of 2005. For Tifa's 17th birthday, Jesse invites Tifa out to a planetology seminar. While others are there to learn more about the planet, it doubles as a recruiting area for Avalanche. The Shinra on the lookout for Avalanche, planetology meetings are basically outlawed. After bonding with Tifa, Jesse has to go into hiding to avoid Shinra. Tifa learns from a local who was at that planetology meeting that Jesse lives in the Sector 7 slums, and the manager of a place called Stargazer Heights would know more. She knows everyone in the Sector 7 slums. On her day off, Tifa heads over and finds Marl is the manager to speak to. Marl had left her contact info at the clinic where she and Tifa received treatment, but Rakesh never gave it to Tifa. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but just know that Rakesh is in fact an asshole. Marl introduces Tifa to Seventh Heaven and its current owner, Monty. They both suggested Tifa to work as a waitress to help bring in customers. The bar is struggling and in heavy debt. A beautiful and kind waitress would make a big difference. It also pays well, so Tifa accepts. At this point, Barrett and Marlene have made it to Midgar. Having met Jesse at a different planetology meeting than Tifa, he finds a purpose and a way to get back at Shinra. So Barrett searches for Jesse, hearing she was also Avalanche, which brings him and Marlene to Seventh Heaven. With no shoes and looking like they haven't showered in two years, an exhausted Barrett and Marlene post up on the deck. And because Barrett is very intimidating and scaring away customers, Tifa talks with them. And after Barrett is very standoffish and seeing the state that Marlene is in as she sleeps, Tifa goes off on Barrett with one of my favorite interactions I've ever read. That's the bar you set for yourself? If you're not dying, you're doing fine? Doesn't your daughter deserve better? She needs a bath. She needs her hair washed. She needs clothes. They don't have to be new, but they should at least be clean. Daddy? Tifa looked over to find she'd woken the girl. Daddy, is the lady angry? No, honey. We're just, uh... Marlene stared up at Tifa. Tears welled in the little girl's eyes. Don't yell at Daddy! Tifa tried to soothe the girl with a smile. I'm sorry. I woke you up, didn't I? Marlene just shook her head violently. Daddy didn't do anything wrong! I know. You're right. I promise not to yell at him. Good. The little girl bobbed her head in satisfaction. The motion shook flakes of dandruff loose from her tangled locks and sent a slight odor wafting through the air, further evidence of how long she'd been without a bath. It broke my heart and warmed it all at the same time. Because there is a secret room below 7th Heaven by use of a pinball machine, Barrett and Marlene are given a place to live. Also, Barrett now has a job as the enforcer for 7th Heaven. Things go well for a couple days, but one day, the owner Monty doesn't show, with his health taking a turn for the worse. He dies, leaving 7th Heaven with no owner and in enough debt to close it down for good. After seeing Marlene afraid to lose the only home she's ever had, Tifa decided to take all the extra money she's been saving on the side to buy 7th Heaven. That night, they decide to grab the money from Tifa's place, but they also hear that Avalanche is walking into a trap set by Shinra, meaning Jesse is in danger. TLDR, Barrett and Tifa go back to the Sector 8 slums and manage to save Jesse from the trap. Up to this point, Jesse was the one in charge of first section of the Midgar Avalanche Division 
division. But this division is very indecisive, considering their leadership, Elf and Fajito, have gone into hiding. So Barrett decides to take charge of Jesse's section in order to actually stick it to Shinra. On the way to pick up Tifa's savings at her place, they arrive to find it gone. One of the lookouts of the property outside said that she saw Rakesh enter Tifa's place a little earlier that day. When they arrive at the clinic, Pops is there and is revealed to be the one in charge of Sector 8, similar to Elmira's family in Sector 5 and Don Corneo in Sector 6. The clinic owes Pops money, and they're short. Reason being is because Rakesh has been gambling money away at Wall Market, so he stole Tifa's money to make up the difference. As it turns out, Tifa had actually paid off her medical bills like a year ago, but was told she still had another three years of payments left, meaning Rakesh has been lying to Tifa this entire time and was only using Tifa to support his gambling. One foot swiveled back, the other snapped high, and the heel of her boot slamming into Rakesh's nose with a satisfying crack. That final sidekick was precisely the resolution I needed. Yes, queen. And from here, Tifa will live in Sector 7 at Stargazer Heights and work as a bartender at 7th Heaven. October 30th, 2006. Shotgun has awoken from her coma. As her first assignment back, she is tasked with capturing an endangered species, a sentient talking dog in Cosmo Canyon for Hojo to experiment on. Currently, there is a rite that must take place with two dogs of the tribe, a female named Danae and a male named Nanaki. It's a tradition and happens every 50 years to honor the planet. In exchange for going with the Turks peacefully, the Turks must not intervene as the rite is being performed. Or at least that's how it happened in Before Crisis initially. After playing Rebirth, it seems they retconned it because it took an entire army invading Cosmo Canyon to kidnap Nanaki, which I'm actually okay with. This portion was ass in Before Crisis. Luckily, my suffering is almost over as we enter the end of the Crisis Saga with the breakout of Hojo's experiments at Nibelheim. Boy, oh boy. The price of freedom is steep. I'll give you 10 minutes. After that, I return to the Turks. Return? Right now, I'm not in the mood. Stand and fight, soldier first class. Zack! The army's mobilizing. Find the targets before they do. I want them alive. You hear me? You're going to save Zack's life. We will all join the live stream. You are no exception. My honor. My dreams. They're yours now. I'm your living legacy. December 19th, 2006. For the past three years, Zack and Cloud have been experimented on but declared failures by Hojo as Sephiroth clones. Abandoned, Zack manages to awaken from his Mako suspension pod, possibly by Angeal's help from beyond the grave, or potentially by fate itself. Zack frees Cloud as well, but Cloud got the worst of the two. You'll find as time progresses in the compilation, Cloud does not deal well with Mako, which is one of the reasons he can never make it into Soldier in the first place. Cloud is now suffering from a severe case of Mako poisoning, which leaves the victim in a catatonic state. The best way Mako poisoning can be described is that while your body is here, your mind and soul are lost, potentially wandering the life stream itself. Not many ever recover from it. With Cloud and Mako so to close, Zack finds an old first class soldier uniform in one of the cupboards in the Shinra Manor where they were kept. And much like every other experiment of Hojo's that Zack had to put down, the Shinra army is now attempting to kill Zack and Cloud. The Turks send Cisne to assist, but after realizing Zack is the person they're hunting, she can't bring herself to call in reinforcements. Instead, she and the rest of the Turks will attempt to keep the two on the run from the Shinra army, even offering a motorcycle to help them make some distance. While Zack and Cloud make their way to Gungaga, the Turks head to Shinra Manor to find out more of the f***ed up shit Hojo's been doing, only for the Turks to find Veld researching as to what Hojo did to Felicia. The Turks decide to commit treason and help Veld for the next few months find all the support materia of Zirconiade before Fajito. President Shinra catches wind of this, but because the Turks are keeping Rufus in their office via that secret wall, he needs to kill the Turks more discreetly. So he asked the loudmouth bitch in the red dress, Scarlet, to do it. 
With Avalanche in disarray, Barrett is tired with the other leaders of the Midgar branch. He believes that more extreme measures are needed to actually save the planet. But his methods are too extreme and don't get any support except from within his own team. So he decides to make his own branch so he can save the planet and get back at Shinra in his own way. Meanwhile, with no more experiments taking place in Nibelheim, Genova is moved from the Mount Nebel reactor and brought to Shinra HQ. Hojo has discovered that Genova and her cells will have the desire to return to each other and become whole. Over the years, Hojo has injected hundreds of people with Genova cells, so he expects all of his experiments to return to Genova for the reunion. February of 2007. The Turks meet Ketsith and learn that Reeve, the person in charge of urban development, is the one controlling him. They have discovered that the old Gangaga reactor is where a support materia is, by using their fortune telling powers. That is never explained. Side note, Kate Sith is actually based on the Scottish and Gaelic folklore Ketchi, or the King of Cats, a fairy spirit about the size of a dog and all black with a white spot on his chest. It was fabled that it had nine lives or it could turn into a witch and back into a cat nine times, and could take the souls of dead people if they walk over their coffins before they were buried. I bring this up because the name pronunciation was a big problem for a while. No official pronunciation of Final Fantasy VII's iteration of the character was given until a tweet came out in 2023 in preparation for Rebirth. The character Kate Sith was originally voiced by Greg Ellis with a Scottish brogue, and the accent remains that way even now. You're really not a bad bloke, are you, Vincent? Ah, you pretend not to care, but you always come through in the end. <laughs> I see. Well, good for you. Never know till you try. So while they acknowledge his Scottish roots, Square has made the decision to refer to this character in their game as Kate Sith. Please don't start a flame war in the comments, I'm just stating the situation. Rufus and Sung begin getting ideas on how to utilize Kate Sith for their reconnaissance. Turks and Kate Sith made it to the Gungaga reactor and run into Shears and Veld who are now working together and they all manage to obtain the support materia there. Now back to Zack, thank fuck. Zack and Cloud reach Gungaga and Zack attempts to see his parents, but Cisne is guarding the town. She's basically like, you you are a fugitive. How did you not think your parents would be the first place we would look for you? But apparently, Zack's parents love Cisne, so she's very welcome there. They'll probably ask you to join the family. Already happened. What? What did you say? I'm sure that won't come up again in Rebirth. Genesis and Hollander are here as well. Apparently, Hollander was on death's door at the hands of Genesis, so he accepted some of Genesis' cells to survive. But now, he's suffering from degradation. Because Zack has already been mutated due to the soldier procedure, Cloud was the only one with pure S cells within him, which they believe can cure their degradation. Or at least Hollander does. After a save from Lazard, having become an angel copy himself, Zack kills Hollander. <laughs> But Genesis escapes to where he believes the gift of the goddess will be found, the ruins of Benora. Now, I really don't want to do this, but I gotta. We have to talk about Loveless. The play Loveless has four acts, with the fifth and final act being lost to time. It will also be seen in some points in the Final Fantasy VII compilation, including the original. Genesis has been attempting to recreate it ever since Hollander's initial attempts failed to cure his degradation. The play reads as follows. When the War of the Beasts brings about the world's end. The goddess descends from the sky. Wings of light and dark spread afar. She guides us to bliss, her gift everlasting. Infinite in mystery is the gift of the goddess. We seek it thus and take to the sky. Ripples form on the water's surface. The wandering soul knows no rest. Three friends go into battle. One is captured. One flies away. The one that is left becomes a hero. Dreams of the morrow hath the shattered soul. Pride is lost. Wings stripped away. The end is nigh. There is no hate, only joy, for you are beloved by the goddess. Hero of the dawn, healer of worlds. My friend, do you fly away now? To a world that abhors you and I? Shut up! All that awaits Shut you up! is a somber you! morrow. No matter where the winds may blow, my soul, corrupted by vengeance, hath endured torment to find the end of the journey 
in my own salvation and your eternal slumber. My friend, the fates are cruel. There are no dreams. No honor remains. The arrow has left. The bow of the goddess. My friend, your desire is the bringer of life, the gift of the goddess. Legend shall speak of sacrifice at world's end. The wind sails over the water's surface, quietly, but surely. The story follows three friends, the prisoner, the wanderer, and their hero. Genesis initially thinks of himself as the hero and Zack as the prisoner. The prisoner's role involves him escaping imprisonment, being wounded but saved by a woman who he would begin a new life with. But racked with guilt, the prisoner would search for his friends to fulfill his promise to them. Zack holds both Sephiroth's cells and Angeal's pride and honor through the Buster Sword, so the three friends are reunited. Genesis challenges Zack to a duel, as Loveless entails, but Genesis got the roles wrong. He was actually the prisoner, and Zack was the hero. The gift of the goddess was actually the pride Genesis lost, the pride of a soldier that Zack champions. Having regained his pride and honor as a soldier from his defeat by Zack, Minerva, the physical manifestation of the life stream, deems Genesis's role unfinished. She grants him his gifts, the cure of his degradation, and is sent back to the land of the living. And if by chance you're still confused, I, 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 I don't know what to tell you, man. I, 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 I'm at a loss for words, dude. I don't know. Oh, God, I'm so tired. I have no idea. This is so confusing. Back on the surface, Lazard is in bad shape. They were attacked by Shinra troopers, and deep ground agents are on their way to retrieve who's there. Lazard states that he received help in keeping Cloud safe. It was the Angeo copy that protected Aerith at the Sector 5 church. Both Lazard and the Angeo copy pass away, but Zack notices that the copy had a letter attached, and it's from Aerith. Over the past four years, Aerith has written letters to Zack and given them to the Turks, hoping that one day, Zack will read them. Because of her central connection, she usually feels the people she has connections to pass away. Makes sense as to why she would write letters to Zack even though he was officially declared killed in action. Because she knew he wasn't dead. This letter is her 89th and had decided to entrust it to the copy because of the connection Angel and Zack share even from beyond the grave. Zack decides he has to go to Midgar. He picks up Cloud and they make tracks. Vice the Immaculate and Nero the Sable of Deep Crown are sent to bring Genesis back with them. After they leave, Genesis leaves behind his interpretation of what the last act of Loveless is, having experienced it himself. Even if the morrow is barren of promises, nothing shall forestall my return. To become the dew that quenches the land, to spare the sands, the seas, the skies. I offer thee this silent sacrifice. You sound stupid! The end of September 2007. The Turks, still undermining Shinra as much as possible, attempt to locate Zack and Cloud before the Shinra army does. But the wastelands are too vast, meaning they don't notice the car that looks like the sand around them carrying their targets. But the army does. After narrowly avoiding a sniper shot aimed at Cloud's head, Zack tells the driver to let them off. After placing Cloud somewhere safe, Zack goes off to face the Shinra army and his fate. The price of freedom is steep. As Zack tackles the seemingly never-ending onslaught in front of him, his life begins flashing before his eyes, of all the friends he made, loved, and lost. 
Only three troopers remain, but Zack can barely move, let alone lift his sword. After he receives a barrage of bullets, Zack falls, with only Aerith on his mind in his dying moments, and Aerith begins to feel the first love of her life begin to slip away. Cloud is not considered worth the bullets due to his Mako poisoning, so he was spared a bullet medley. After the troopers leave, Cloud crawls his way to Zack. With Zack's dying words, he entrusts that Cloud will live on for the both of them. The Genova inside Cloud activates, allowing Zack to literally save his memories to the Cloud. With Buster Sword in hand and the memories of a first class soldier, Cloud stumbles his way to Midgar, allowing Zack the hero to rest. And that is the end of the Crisis Saga. Thank you so much for watching. Um, it took me a while to get through that, but that's that's it. <laughs> please, please don't make me do it. It ended so well. It ended so well. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, I'm going to sum this up in as few sentences as I possibly can. Shotgun and Veld end up finding the final support materials, but the army decides that Veld needs to be captured and executed. They go ahead and capture him. The other Turks manage to go ahead and get him away. And to make a long story short, too late! Fujito manages to grab all the support materia and summon Zaconiade. All of the Turks that were not in the original Final Fantasy VII defeat Zaconiade and are declared killed in action. And apparently nobody noticed this world-ending threat in the sky. No one acknowledges it. No one cares. Now back to the people we actually care about. We end the Crisis Saga in the Sector 7 slums. Cloud has managed to wander himself into Midgar, but is now in a catatonic state again near the train station. Tifa, having walked by on her way for groceries for the bar, sees him there. Upon closer inspection and realizing it's Cloud, Cloud manages to be sentient again. He has his memories back from before he joined Shinra but he now has the narrative that he became a soldier, made it to first class, and knows what happened in Nibelheim except for how Sephiroth was defeated. As far as he's concerned, the last time he and Tifa saw each other was five years ago in Nibelheim. But to Tifa, the last conversation they had together was seven years ago, before Cloud left town. Tifa, not wanting Cloud to disappear again and trying to figure out what's wrong with him, goes along with whatever narrative he says. Because whenever she questions the events or validity of the stories, Cloud begins to break. In a current scene throughout a majority of Final Fantasy VII, OG, and the remake saga, his mind has too many things competing with each other, making it fragile. After bringing Cloud to Seventh Heaven, Cloud states that he is now a mercenary for hire, something Zack had plans to be when he arrived in Midgar. Tifa suggests that she can hire him for a job. Barret has made plans to bomb Mako Reactor 1, stopping more of the life stream from being sucked up and used. Cloud agrees, setting in motion the beginning of the original Final Fantasy VII. My name is Cloud. Soldier. First class. <laughs> Finally! Hey there, everybody. Um, I'm terrible with outros. Uh, this is like my third time recording this, so I'll just get right to the point. I just want to say thank you guys so much for the support. Feel free to tune in for part five. We're going to be covering the original Final Fantasy VII, as well as the novel On the Way to a Smile. I will be attempting to stream. It's been about a month since Rebirth's release, so I feel uh, less worried about people running into spoilers. So feel free to stop by as I finish some stuff up and then move on to doing my hard mode playthrough. I may also pair it actually with doing Final Fantasy 7 New Threat Mod 2. Um, I just need to go ahead and uh, update that. Thank you guys so much for sticking around and I will see you for part 5.